Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. We are now in unit four, our poetics unit. We are studying a number of collections of poetry. We are in poetry collection number six. We're going to look at three offerings. We're going to begin with Edna St. Vincent Millay's Conscientious Objector. Before we get there, though, write this down in 2B. Our focus here continues to be figurative language, especially the simile, the metaphor, and personification. Simile, of course, comparisons using like or as, metaphors that direct comparison, and then, of course, personification to somehow give to some uh, non-human object human characteristics. The arms of Ruthie's tree that sway or dance in the wind would be an example of personification. We're going to now turn to uh, page 724. Some of those vocabulary words will end up on the assessment. We want to study those. Uh, notice our big question on 724. Does all communication serve a positive purpose? It's clear that the answer to that is sometimes you know, there can be a negative uh, purpose with some communication. But the challenges here of this poetry are, are the ones that we obviously are doing our best to internalize. Let's introduce ourselves to Edna St. Vincent Millay. We'll see her several times in our high school career. A brilliant poet. Notice your dates. 1892 to 1950. Millay was not yet in college when she first won fame as a poet. After graduating from Vassar she, uh, in New York, she, worked, uh, she moved to New York City where she acted in plays and pursued her, act, her writing career. Beautiful and outspoken, she received both praise and scorn for her controversial opinions on issues such as women's rights. Um, and to that degree, then, she was an influential voice in reform. I would write that down. Now, let's make sure we understand the definition of conscientious objector. I'm on page 726. At the bottom of the page, you are provided with the definition. Uh, conscientious objector is one who refuses to participate in warfare for religious or ethical reasons. Maybe the most famous in the 20th century exemplar of this was Muhammad Ali, who refused to participate in war. Um, Any time a person says, I refuse to fight in a war for religious or ethical reasons, I don't agree with it, I don't believe in it, that is a conscientious objector. Now what's interesting in this poem is to identify, write this down in 2B, who the speaker of the poem is and who the audience, who is the speaker speaking to. Let's now play the game. It's a compelling little poem. I hope it challenges you as it has prior sophomores. Let's enjoy it. Conscientious Objector by Edna St. Vincent Millay. I shall die, but that is all that I shall do for death. I hear him leading his horse out of the stall. I hear the clatter on the barn floor. He is in haste. He has business in Cuba, business in the Balkans, many calls to make this morning. But I will not hold the bridle while he cinches the girth, and he may mount by himself. I will not give him a leg up. Though he flick my shoulders with his whip, I will not tell him which way the fox ran. With his hoof on my breast, I will not tell him where the black boy hides in the swamp. I shall die, but that is all that I shall do for death. I am not on his payroll. I will not tell him the whereabouts of my friends, nor of my enemies either. Though he promise me much, I will not map him the route to any man's door. Am I a spy in the land of the living that I should deliver men to death? Brother, the password and the plans of our city are safe with me. Never through me shall you be overcome. All right, let's pause for a moment now and just identify the answer to the questions that I ask at the beginning. Let's work now level one quickly. Who is the speaker in this poem? Okay. We might say the conscientious objector, someone defiant, someone who says, don't tell me what to do. No, I am not helping you. Who is the speaker speaking to? Well, now that's interesting because at first, clearly, we get a sense that the speaker is maybe speaking to death. But notice at the end of the poem, the word brother gets used, which tells us that the speaker of the poem is speaking to all of humanity and saying what? Two things. One, I will not give in to death. I will not. I will not participate in helping death do death's work. Number two, I'm challenging the speaker of the poem. I'm challenging all of my other humans, he calls 
all of us brothers. The speaker calls all of us brothers. I'm challenging all of us to participate in this project of taking care of each other, living to help each other. Let's watch how this project happens. And right away, obviously, in 3A, we're going to remember a text like, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, Dylan Thomas is offering. There, are, there, there will be a number of texts in 3A that will immediately come to mind. This idea of whatever happens when you leave the park after you've been swinging and you've got to go to the van, and we all must go to the van sooner or later, don't go willingly. Go struggling and fighting. There's obviously the other argument that at the moment of your death, you should be ready and willing to, to go. Notice here, though, I'm not going to help death out. The word pictures are compelling, though, the imagery. And again, our question is not just what is it, but how does it work? Let's take a look. I shall die, but that is all that I shall do for death. Uh, by the way, no, death capitalized. Did you see it? I hear him. Him who? Death. Now we've got death personified. Now we're familiar with images of death. Let's talk about that one quickly. We're familiar with images of death like our Scrooge story where death is co you know, covered in black with the sight and all of that kind of stuff, right? But notice here, death is a rider of the pony and the speaker is the one who prepares the pony in the stable. Notice, I hear him, death, leading his horse out of the stall. I hear the clatter on the barn floor. He's in haste. And then the ironic observations, given the time when this poem was written about Cuba and the Balkans, these were areas where major conflict were either about to happen or had already happened. Many calls to make this morning. I'll not hold the bridle while he senses the girth. In other words, gets the pony ready that he may mount by himself. I will not give him a leg up. An interesting, ironic observation. I'm not going to help death do anything that death likes to do. In other words... I'm going to take care of those around me. I'm not going to allow for those around me to in any way be affected by death. Notice, though he flicked my shoulders with his whip, I will not tell him which way the fox ran. Oftentimes this would be the case of the use of the stable boy, right? To tell where the fox ran. With his hoof on my breast, I will not tell him where the black boy hides in the swamp. We have slave language here. In other words, the, um, death is portrayed as the, the returner of, of runaway fugitive slaves. I'm not going to help in that project at all. I shall die, but that is all that I shall do for death. I'm not on his payroll. I owe death absolutely nothing. I won't tell him with the whereabouts of my friends, nor my enemies either. In other words, I'm going to show humanity humanity. I'm going to take care of, of all humanity. Though he promised me much, I will not map him the route to any man's house. We think you're a good spouse and the idea of selling your soul to the devil with Mephistopheles and all of that. Am I a spy? Uh-oh, let's put this in our notes at 2B. The use of the rhetorical question. Am I a spy in the land of the living that I should deliver men to death? Again, notice death being personified, capitalized. And then finally, brother, the password and the plans of our city are safe with me. Never through me shall you be overcome. The idea of the use of the word overcome, of course, will tie this poem as well to the civil rights movement and the very popular song, We Shall Overcome. The idea, of course, is that I will not aid death in overcoming human, and in the process of doing so, I will overcome death. By the way, put it at 3A really quickly. When you're a senior, we're going to do a famous poem called Sonnet 10, Holy Sonnet 10, by John Donne, where he will say, Death be not proud. Um, the idea is that you can live your life without fearing death. You can, in fact, live your life without being worried or anxious about death and dying. At 2A, what's the major message here? Well, I think there's at least two. We've said already, live your life with courage. Live, live your life with bravery. Don't be worried about the end of your life so badly that you don't get to live and enjoy your life. And then secondly, this poem says, you have an obligation to take care of those in this world, to take care of those around you. Notice, not just your friends in this poem, but even your enemies. We have to take care of each other. At 2B, well, notice we have repetition here. Notice we have rhetorical questions here. Notice we have the personification of death, which is kind of a profound uh, personifying of death. At 3A, so many titles come to mind here. Jot down for you, what is your favorite text that personifies death in some way? I mentioned the Scrooge story. What is that personification for you that best works for death? And that notion of talking back to death.
being defiant, if you will, to death. Finally, at 3b, what is the text for you, as you think about it, that best informs the following question? To what degree do you worry about the end of your life? The great Woody Allen, the comedian, said, I don't fear death, I just don't want to be around when it happens. That notion of how much of worrying about leaving the park and going to the van informs your thinking about your life. Back up to 3a, the classic text on this topic is Phaedo, Plato's great dialogue where Socrates is ready to leave. Socrates, the one who said the unexamined life is not worth living. Socrates, who's about to drink the hemlock poison to be executed by the state, and he's hanging out with all of his buddies, and they're having conversation, and he's giddy happy about the fact that he's about to die, and they cannot understand this at all, and he says, why? My soul can't die. And the rest of the dialogue is a conversation about what it means to have a soul. And to recognize that soul can't die. That is to say, death can't touch that part of you that you can't touch physically, right? Finally, in what ways do you feel like you are a conscientious objector, a fighter, a struggler? In what ways do you think of yourself as that kind of a struggler? I hope that this is a poem uh, that has challenged you in some ways. Thank you.